Okay. Um, so we were looking at you know deadlocks and, and, and stuff like that, right? So before we proceed, I wanted to give a sense of why. How many of you find this particular uh, topic exciting? <laughs> I have rarely found someone who says like, "Yeah, deadlock," right? I mean, I was it made my day, right? But what? So the reason why we are going through them is is based on hardware trend, right? So that's the trend which is given here, right? Assume a given hardware generation, so we're not talking about different hardware generations. Do you prefer a two gigahertz processor or two one gigahertz processor or four half gigahertz cores, whatever, right? So the idea here is like they somehow add up to two, right? So if you put on a hardware person hat, you guys haven't had a course in hardware yet, right? Uh, architecture, of course, yet, right? But just just um, thinking about you know what what might be the reason, right? If you have a hardware person hat, which one would you prefer? Not the OS software person, but the hardware person. Yeah. The first one because it's going to be cheap. <laughs> okay. Hassle. For hardware. So you, okay. If you want to make life more interesting, just make it into 8, eight gigahertz. <laughs> what? You want this? You want this? Any of those are better than the ones on the right. No, no, so, so I mean, you, know, you, have to, you, have to, you have to compare this way or this way, right? So, yeah. Uh, as a hardware person, I'd probably go for the four two gigahertz because four individual cores run, or processors running at a slower speed is a lot easier to deal with. You don't have as much heat dissipation. Um, yeah, so so that's the component you'll you'll learn in the hardware uh, hardware class, right? Here. Yes. We talked about the uh, um, Sony's like cell processor and like when one of those cores breaks, you have other cores you can fall back on that still works. So having multiple cores is a is good as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Multiple cores, you have, you know, you can uh, afford, you know, some of them to fail, and you still are, are okay, right? If you're so, if you're buying as a Sony, then you don't probably care, right? But if you're buying it as a laptop, if 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 Apple sells you a laptop and they say it, there's four cores, but depending on what your lock is, it could be three or two, right? I don't think you'll be too happy, right? Sony kind of okay because they're in a different price-conscious model, right? Yeah, heat is the biggest issue, right? You, we know how to build two gigahertz processors. We know how to build three, maybe four, right? At eight gigahertz, your, your processor is probably hot as a nuclear reactor kind of thing at, at the core, right? So when it gets that hot, you probably can't put it in a laptop, right? Most of our laptops are not really laptops because if you put them on your lap, it, it burns you, right? When you, when you go to faster, right? How many of you actually have a laptop on the lap and are in the pillow in the bed, and then find out that your whole bed is like kind of hard, right? <laughs> yeah, laptops are not really laptops. Uh, not laptops, unless you are running somewhere like here, right? If you go here, if you yeah, there's no way we can go here. We don't know how to get to eight gigahertz, right? We know how to get to eight gigahertz if you have cooling and a whole bunch of other hardware stuff, right? So we are kind of forced to go here, right? Intel is, does not really want to go to multiple core. But they know how to get here, but they don't know how to go here, right? So if you want to go in the future, you have to have more cores, right? If you run it as a slower processor, it's not that hard. Your battery life is good. And there are other, other issues. Like one of the thing is like, you know, you have a um, little bit of um, reliability um, you, can, you can deal with. The other thing is, if you're not fully using all the CPU, you can turn off the cores, right? And, and, and on a laptop, that's, that's really welcome, right? So if you're using a laptop, it could potentially turn off three of the cores and only run it as half a gigahertz processor, even reducing the, the uh, amount of energy it takes, right? So from a hardware perspective, they have no choice but to go towards more cores, right? They can't keep up with this race. They can't keep, you know, think of this, right? They can't do this. So right now, the, 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 the normal processes are 
2 gigahertz, right? If you if you buy a laptop or something, 2 gigahertz is a, is a fairly decent speed, right? So when you think of the, the, the Intel 80 core processor, there's no way we know how to do 160 gigahertz, right? Which is what they essentially the 80, 80 core processor will run in five or 10 years, right? So from a software perspective, after going through the, you know, the synchronization, all those things, right? Which one do you prefer? A. A, A's, right? You prefer the A because it it's, makes life a little easier for you, right? It's not that much easier because you, you know, one of the arguments we made was even on a single processor, you want threads to give you more uh, stuff, but you're kind of okay, right? But at the end, the software person loses, right? Because you know, the hardware trend is they can't keep up doing this. If you want anything faster, you have to go with the hardware, right? And that brings up another issue, that, uh, another tension between the hardware and the software folks, right? So hardware folks would love to add as many cores as they want and then ship the stuff to you, right? And software person is the one who fail the pain of like dealing with deadlocks and, and all those things. So there's a constant tension on what you want to do, right? So if you talk to hardware person, they can do a whole bunch of stuff to make the whole processor go faster and push all the complication to the software side and software, so you know, people keep fighting, right? And that's a constant battle between Intel and Microsoft, Intel and, and Apple or what have you, right? Whatever Intel makes, you have to have Apple or Microsoft provide the corresponding stuff to, to make life easier for you, right? So if, if Intel makes 80 crore processor and if Microsoft OS cannot deal with more than one processor, then it's, it's as good as just having one core, right? So I hope you appreciate, even though it's, it's painful and all those things, um, that's the future. I mean, there's, unless we figure out some way to build faster and cooler process, single processor, um, we're kind of stuck with this model of having more, more, more and more cores. And once you add more and more cores, if your program does not utilize any of this stuff, if you don't use multiple threads or, you know, if you don't deal with all this stuff, then, you, then your product is pretty slow, right? And, and, and that's the message I got from the Apple person too. If you, if you can't deal with deadlocks and all those things, there's not a much of a future, like, you know, except for, I guess, like writing um, simple programs kind of stuff, right? So, yeah, I, I feel your pain, but, you know, it, it's, it's, you, you have to go to the, uh, this component, right? So we have two more. So is the notion of deadlocks um, clear from, from the last lecture, right? So we are, we are, we are essentially we are going through a state where there are multiple processes or, or threads, each of which are requesting certain, you know, they have, they're holding on to some resources and they want some other resource. And these resources are not preemptible, so you can't take them away. And you know, till they finish, they, they're not gonna give the resources back. So essentially you get into a point where it's all deadlocked, right? Meaning like nobody can make progress till somebody else finishes and you're just stuck there, right? And so now we're going through ways of how you would see when deadlock is happening, right? And how you would deal with them, how you can avoid them and so on. Like what, what is this phenomenon, right? The, the stuff we left off was looking at the resource allocation graph, which which you can draw to see if there's actually a deadlock, right? So here's the example of resource allocation graph, where the square boxes are the resources, and each dot shows how many of the particular resources there, and the round ones are the processes. If an error goes from a process to a resource, that means the process is requesting that resource, and if an error goes from the resource to a process, that means the process, the resource was allocated to the particular process. And if you see a loop here, a circular loop, you know, involving many different processes, then essentially you have a deadlock because they are all waiting for this, um, the particular process. And it, it becomes a little bit tricky when you have more than one resource because then you have to make sure that there is no possible way that, that you know, the, whoever is in the deadlock can release that resource, right? So in this case, even though there are two resources of R2, right, P1 and P2, both of them each have one resource, right? And they're waiting for something that P3 has through P2, right? So this, you know, 
you get into a deadlock even though you have two resources of R2 because P3 also wants R2. But P3 cannot finish its job till P2 releases it and P2 cannot release it till P1 releases R1 and so on. So you're, you're in a deadlock, right? And here's an example where even though there is a circle, there is no deadlock. So even here, it looks like P1, R1, P3, R2, there's a circular weight, but it's really not, right? Because the resources R1 and R2, there are two of them. So if P2 ever finishes independently, or P4 ever finishes independently, P4 will release R2, R2 will be given by P3, and, and they can solve it, right? So there can never be a deadlock in this situation, if, even if like P2 and P4 are stuck, and the, or if they don't finish? If they don't finish, you're starving, right? It's, it's not deadlock, okay. right? Yeah, if, if P2 and P4 kind of go to sleep, they never wake up, you are in a starvation condition, okay. right? But eventually, you always assume that all the processes would eventually do something, right? So eventually, if, if P2 or P4 finish their task, then, then this can be broken, right? Okay. So in, in a deadlock condition, you can wait forever, nothing, nothing can break, right? Yeah. So in this state, they may have to wait for a while, yeah. eventually they'll be able to run again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's the dis distinction between starvation and deadlock. Right? When you're in a starvation condition, um, yeah, if, if P4 was waiting for a long time, you'll be waiting for a long time, but time is not the essence. We are, we are trying to see if, if we can ever finish. So if you go in, like in the, in the previous example, in this state, you can wait forever, but you'll never get out of deadlock, right? Unless you can preempt the resource or unless you break the conditions, the four conditions that, that we, we saw, right? So the key to remember is if there are no, if there are no, circ no cycles, then there are no deadlocks, right? If there are cycles, then there could be deadlock depending on, you know, if there's only one instance of a resource, then there's no deadlock. But if there are more instances, then you have to do this analysis to actually see when there's a deadlock, right? For example, in this case, even though it looks like there's a cycle, it doesn't have to be a deadlock because there's, you know, we know that P2 and P4, when they finish, they can, they can get us out of the stalemate, right? So what that means is, there's, there are conditions where, there, where it's easy to know whether there's a deadlock. If there's no cycles, there's no deadlock. If there's one single resource and it looks like there's a cycle, then that's a deadlock. But if there are more resources, then you have to, be, you have to do some more analysis to figure out whether there's actually a deadlock, because it, look, it may look like a deadlock, but eventually it can, it can finish, right? So, so deadlocks are bad because once deadlock happened, you know, as we saw in the quiz, it, it kind of propagates throughout the system. So essentially, when you have deadlock, you have to deal with it. You can't just say, I don't, you know, I don't really care about these processes because they slow, you know, once they start touching stuff, then it'll fail, right? So next time you use your operating system and it looks like something failed, right? It usually happens when, you're, when you have some hardware failure, right? You're, you pull the CD of, you know, before it's supposed to do or pull the USB key before it's supposed to do. Typically, those times you get into a deadlock because there may be a write which is waiting for the USB key and, and so on, right? And you'll notice that it slowly will propagate and more and more of the process will, will, will eventually get into deadlock, right? So the way to deal with that is to make sure that the system will never enter deadlock condition, right? So you have to keep constantly monitoring the system whenever you're allocating resources to make sure that if you give this resource allocation, you'll never get into a deadlock, right? And that particular model is, is, is pretty uh, conservative because it's trying to prevent any deadlock from happening where they may or may not happen. So as we saw in the, in the when you have two resources, right, it doesn't always have to get into a deadlock. So it, it looks like it may get into a deadlock and you have, to, you have to be kind of pessimistic and make sure that that never happens, right? The other option is to let you enter into a deadlock and then deal with it, right? So rather than, rather than doing um, proactive action, wait for the whole system to get into a deadlock, and when it gets to a deadlock, try to recover from it, right? And recover from it means that you have to go through and break the four conditions. We'll see how you break the four conditions, right? And the other, other case is pretend, I mean, don't care about deadlocks, deal, you know, let, let 
You just ignore the fact that it deadlocks ever happened, right? Most operating systems that you buy on the market do that. They basically ignore the deadlocks. If you get into deadlock, you basically have to reboot the machine, right? And that's fine for, for most machines. Um, the reason they do that is the, the cost of making sure that deadlock never happens is, is fairly expensive that, you know, they just say it's a, it's a laptop, it's a desktop, you can, you can reboot it, right? You may not be so, so casual if you're dealing with um, mainframes, right? So mainframes are these, you know, these big computers that you buy for, for doing enterprise-wide, like, you know, some serious stuff. And those machines are, you want them to be, to run. You, you can't afford to reboot, right? Imagine what would happen if Citibank has to, you know, the, the main system which, which deals with all the transaction crashes and they have to reboot in the middle of the day, right? The amount of transactions which would fail is enormous, right? So one other anecdote, um, this, this is from IBM. You know, IBM used to make the, these, these big, uh, big mainframes and stuff. So this was back in um, like mid-90s and stuff, and everybody was on the Java bandwagon. Everybody was trying to do Java, right, for all kind of machines and stuff. So somebody wanted to build Java for mainframes, right, because, you know, mainframes sound like a good idea, so they wanted to do a mainframe Java, right? So it turns out on the mainframe, the time to schedule a new, the, the, the time, you know, the, the amount of time you allocate to a process is fairly high because you know they, they're used to processing a lot of stuff. They're not interactive machines. They're not, they're not meant for people to log in and do stuff, right? So let's assume that they, the time is one second. Every one second, you schedule a new process, right? Which would make all your Java programs run horrendous because they have lots of threads and stuff and they assume interactive kind of process, right? So if you put a GUI on a mainframe, and if it takes up to one second for scheduling a different thread, you know what have you, then then it was horrendous, right? So the the you know the Java group said, oh, why don't you change that one second to ten millisecond or something? Right? I mean, it, probably nothing can go wrong, right? So we are talking to the um, the hardware, the, the the mainframe mainframe division at, at IBM. So it turns out they actually think plot stuff for decades, right? So when they want to change something. They, it takes you know you put you, you put your request on. I want to reduce the time scale from one second to half a second, and you put it up in the queue, and it may be implemented in ten or twenty years, right? Which seemed like a kind of dumb idea. Why you do that, right? So the reason is one of the main customers. This is one of the customers. I mean, they have other customers. Is the Bank of Japan, right? They hadn't rebooted the machine in fifteen years, right? which doesn't mean that the machine is actually running for 15 years. It's not the same machine which is running for the 15 years, right? Because obviously hardware fails and stuff. What really happens is when you want to replace some hardware, right? In most of these machines, you can shut off that particular hardware, you can remove from the operating system, put a new hardware, and then you keep running, right? So essentially the new hardware is not the same as the old hardware, but the machine never crashed or machine never rebooted, right? Does that make sense? Right. So if you want to take down the CPU, it has multiple CPUs, right? You you go in and you shut off, you tell the OS that this particular CPU will not be available and the scheduler will not use it. You replace the CPU with a new CPU, which is faster, right? Or better, or what, what have you. And then the machine starts using that CPU, right? And, and they do that for all the hardware, right? And it's been running like that for 15 years, right? They, what they haven't done is updated the, the, the kernel, right? They, they, they do make tweaks to the way it's stuff happens because you know, 15 years is a long time for progress to happen, right? But they have to be careful on what they do because that machine is running for 15 years, right? And, and that's a point of pride. I mean, you know, they can go tell Bank of uh, Japan, if you ever think of going to our competitors, look at our track record, right? 15 years, the machine has never gone down, right? I mean, it, it goes through a period of, less service when they're replacing some components and then it goes up, right? So when you're operating on that kind of schedule, right, you better know how to deal with deadlocks, right? Because re rebooting that machine is, is not just disruptive to the bank, it's disruptive to your reputation, right? So on those kind of scenarios, you want to make sure that dead, you, you always take care of deadlock. You don't really care about the speed as much. You, you want to make sure that the system never crashes and the system never does anything, right? So what we study is important in the, in the context that you have to know how to deal with them. Doesn't mean that you want to do it on your, on your laptop because 
your laptops, especially with Windows, tend to crash so often that, you know, what's one more crash to you kind of stuff, right? <laughs> How many of you think that's a, find it kind of disturbing that that's the attitude that, you know, these vendors seem to have, right? Um, regardless, that's the, that's how stuff is, right? Um, it's frustrating because even, even, I mean, maybe I'm not doing something as important as Bank of Japan, but whatever I'm doing, um, crashes are fairly disruptive, right? And they, they only seem to happen when you don't want them, right? Mm -hmm. But like the, the first day of class, before you start the class, you know, this machine crashed, right? Um, so the way to prevent, so, so we look at ways to prevent deadlocks or way to like uh, recover from deadlocks, right? The way to prevent deadlock is, you know there are four conditions, they all, have to, they all have to happen simultaneously, right? So if you can avoid those conditions from happening, then maybe you won't, you won't have to deal with deadlocks, right? So the first one is the, the mutual exclusion principle, right? You have to hold something, um, that only one one process can hold, right? So you can't share the resource. So how would you make a, a resource which is non-shareable shareable? For example, think of printers, right? Printers, you don't want to give it to two processes at the same time because then you know you'll have a you're gonna have a jumbled up output, right? You're gonna have a jumbled up in some strange way, but there are some characters in the first output, second, you know, some from the second program and they're going crazy, right? How would you deal with resources like printers which are non-shareable fundamentally because those are you know, not designed to be shareable, right? The same for scanners, right? If you want to put a scanner, you can't have two process scanning the same, different documents at the same time. You know, they have to go one after the other. How would you make them shareable? Yeah. Maybe give them buffers. Yeah. And, and you, you give them buffers and, and you usually call them spool, right? So if you have printers, most of the modern operating systems don't directly print to the printer, but they have a program which essentially prints to the printer, right? And, and you create all the output, give it to that program, and then it prints it out. And you spool it, buffer it, what have you, and then send it out, right? There are some which you, you can't do like that. I mean, if you're having a scanner, it's, it's, you know, it's coming from the scanner, so you would have to do it. Um, you can't do that, that kind of a trick. But in the case of printers, you rarely print, you rarely have conditions where you're printing directly to the printer, right? So if you have used like, you know, the Windows, the earlier versions of Windows, where they didn't do spooling, right? You got into a lot of deadlocks because of printer. I mean, the, if the printer dies, if the printer, something happens to a printer, and it couldn't recover from the printer, the whole machine kind of dies because that, from that point on, any pro process which uses a printer would deadlock, and you essentially have to reboot, right? So you can avoid some of this stuff by essentially making them spoolable, right? So, so that way you avoid some, you know, you, you prevent some deadlocks from happening and you prevent dealing with, with many of those, right? So the, the next condition was hold and wait, right? So for deadlock to happen, the processes involved should be holding on to some resources and should wait for some other resource, right? You can't get into a deadlock if you don't have any other resource. You have to have some resource and you want some other resource, right? And how, how, would, you, how would you break that, um, how, would you prevent the, from, how would you prevent that condition from happening where you're holding something and you're waiting for some resource? I think the answer is over there, right? Yeah? You can only request a resource when you're not holding a resource. Yeah. So essentially, you you break it by, yeah. You you're not allowed to do the get into the state where if you want another resource, you give up all the resources that you have, bring it back to the system, and then you request all of it again, right? It's highly inefficient because if you had like ten resources and you want one more, you give up all the resources you have, right? And you wait for to getting all the 11 back, right? So you have to ask, I want all 11, right? Which means that you may have slowly built up to have 10 resources, and then all the small processes which only need few resources, you know, it, 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 all the short or resources, processes which need few resources, they get to go, 
and processes which require a lot of resources have to wait because they essentially have to give up all the resource and get all the stuff, right? So it's low, low resource utilization because you're giving up everything and then you're getting everything back, giving up everything, getting it back. But that will avoid deadlocks, right? But it's kind of annoying because you know, you're know you not making progress, right? If you, especially if you have a lot of resources, then essentially your, pro, your program is, is stopping, you know, stopped all the time, but you won't get into deadlock, right? Professor? Yeah. Uh, in this case, wouldn't each process only be able to hold one resource at a time? Or can, or so you can, so, so, you, so you, you, you get all resources at the same time, right? But you're not allowed to wait on stuff. So you're allowed to hold, but you're not allowed to wait, right? So if you, if you want 11, you give away the 10, and then you tell the OS, give me all the 11 or none at all, right? So yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not allowed to get five and then wait for the other six. Right. So you have to give everything, and then you have to say, I want all the 11 back. Yeah. Could it implement some sort of time limit on the waits? Like, rather than giving up all 10 resources, say you're allowed to request resource 11 for 20 seconds, and if you don't get it, then you have to let go of all your resources or something? Um, so did, 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 you, did you follow the question? Right. So the question was, if you wanted the 11th, 11th resource, can you say, Give it to me within the next 20 seconds or some time, and if you don't, if you if you can't give me the resource within that time, don't give that to me at all, right? So that makes writing a program more complicated, right? So the that's one way to deal with deadlocks by basically giving a time frame. But how do you come up with, as a programmer? How do you come up with a a, a good time, right? As a as a programmer, you don't know what is a good time because 20 20 seconds might mean that. You know, if you waited 22 seconds, things might have kind of worked out, right? And most of the times when you have running a writing a process, when you don't get a resource, you have no idea what to do, right? Unless you have write a very complicated program, right? So, if, so assume, assume you're a printer, right? And you're writing a program where you need the printer as 11th resource that you want to print out, right? And it says you don't have the printer. What do you do, right? Most applications don't know what to do because they created all this output. It has to go to the printer. Printer is not available, um, right? So yeah, you could do that, but it, it, it makes the stuff even more complicated, right? Yeah. So a lot of the processes to request resources only when um, they have none uh, usually leads to no progress. What if you uh, implement a system in the OS where um, you look at these resource dependencies and you sort of uh, Manage processes so they'll eventually get to run. Um, can you avoid this like no progress scenario? No, we will we'll, we'll see uh, that, that condition uh, <coughs> okay. at the next few slides, right? Yeah, the, the OS can actually look at all the processes and, and kind of look ahead to see where where things might break down, right? Um, and I think as, as as mentioned, it's not a trivial task. You have to do graph graph traversal and stuff to figure out. Um, the, the, the calculations to figure out if, if they're going to get into a deadlock is not trivial, right? It, it's trivial on the cases that we talked about, but in real machines, they may have lots of resources, right? Let, suppose there are like 100 processors with like 1,000 resources, trying to figure out what's the, you know, doing the graph. And remember, this has to be done every time you ask for a resource, right? So if you ask for a keyboard, and I have to go run this whole code to figure out and come back to you after five minutes, right? Then yeah, you avoid deadlocks, but the machine is basically so extremely slow. Right? I had a there's some other question from this side. So these are heuristics that you try, you, you kind of you you kind of use to avoid deadlocks from happening. Right? You can think of individual programmatic ways to solve these problems, and but the but the key here is we are trying to figure out how the OS can get involved and, and help you in some in some some way. Right? And the key here is you don't want this stuff to be so complicated that the OS is basically just doing this, just making sure the deadlock does not happen and not actually make progress, right? So if the deadlock happens once once a day or once in a week, right, you don't want to do all this stuff because then um, you don't make progress at all, but you avoid that once in a week kind of thing, right? <clears throat> Then, then you avoid the, you know, the, the third condition was the no preemption. So if you, ha if you hold on to a resource, then no preemption says that I cannot take the resource from you, right? Um, 
So breaking the preemption assumption would 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 cost cost a lot of changes in your program, right? So if you're if you're assuming like a printer when you're directly printing to the to the printer, if you if you preempt you, if I you know if I um, So if, if I have to preempt you from holding those resources, then I have to essentially give the resource back to you or some way to buffer the output so I can send it off next time and, and make it not visible to you. Right? So it doesn't work in a general case, but it works in some cases. Right? Um, and, the, and the circular weight, is essentially, you know, if you ask the resources any order, you can get into a circular weight. And the way to avoid them is to arbitrarily number all the resources in some order and only make you request resources in certain order, right? So for example, if you number the resources from in the ascending order, right? So you can say you can only request resources whose number is higher than what you have, but never lower, right? So if you have resource one, you're allowed to re request any resource above one, but nothing below. So if you have resource 10, you're only allowed to request resources which are 11 through whatever, but not nine, so that way you avoid uh, a circular list, right? So you have to arbitrarily number these things, and but the but the key problem here is um, you have so programmer has to now be aware of of this numbering scheme, and they have to be aware of so they have to request certain resources first before they use them or, or what have you, right? So the um, so those those are those are ways to prevent deadlocks. You know, so if you implement those mechanisms, then essentially you don't get into deadlocks at all. Um, so another way to is to uh, avoid deadlocks, right? Where you may get into deadlocks, but you assume that for the most part you don't get into deadlock. Right? It's not preventing it. You'll get into some conditions where it's unsafe, but um, for the most part you'll, you'll um, work. Um, so one, one of the ways is for you to def declare all the resources that you would want, right? So the system can avoid deadlocks if it knew what resources you would want, right? So the, the problem is if you're running as a regular process, you request resources when you need them. So I have to run a test when you're requesting to see if you get into a deadlock. So if I run, if you tell me before you start the process, these are the resources I would need, I'm not gonna tell you when I need them, right? So I can figure out if you'll ever run into a deadlock if I allocate the resource to you, and then and then use that to um, schedule you, schedule schedule you or not, right? Um, and so it has to keep looking at the current. So it has to see what it has, and it has to see what you're requesting, what other paths are requesting, to see if there's a possibility for deadlock, and if there is, then it doesn't let you uh, proceed, right? Hang on, hang on. Let's see if I have that. Yeah, so this this is the okay. So for, for 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 doing the deadlock avoidance, you define a notion of a safe state, right? A safe state is a state where um, you you are not getting going to get into a deadlock, right? So safe state is if you know if you go back to the the couple of slides back when you're talking about so if you if you if you don't get if you don't have all the four conditions, then you're not in deadlock state. So you're in a safe state, right? But if you have multiple resources of a particular kind, right, and if you have a cycle, you could be in deadlock and depends on others, other conditions, right? So the safe state is a state where there's no condition of a, of a there's no possibility of a deadlock, um, which would mean that either there's no cycle right now or there's a way for processes to finish and then re leave resources back to you and then you can make progress, right? So if you're in a safe state, there's no possibility of a deadlock. If you're in an unsafe state, that means you could get into deadlock because the resources allocated to you could is potentially bad, but it doesn't have to get into a deadlock, right? Depending on what would happen, you, you may get into deadlock, you may not get into deadlock. And so I think this is an easier example to kind of visualize, right? So there's a, there's a set of states where there's no possibility of deadlock because none of the four conditions are true. And there's a set of states where it's unsafe because some of these conditions are true, but in the bigger scheme, things are still still safe. And then you get into deadlock, right? So if you have multiple resources, 
there's a possibility that it looks like a, 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 a cyclic cyclic weight, but it's not it's not a deadlock because there's 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 ways to get away from it, right? So if you want to dead, avoid deadlock, you want to so if you it's it's clear what happens when you're in the safe state. I mean, if you're in the safe state, it's it's fine, right? You have to be careful when you get into unsafe state because unsafe state you could either get into deadlock. So if you want to avoid you want to avoid going into unsafe state or go into unsafe state when you know you can get back, get back to the safe state, right? So if we again use the notion of the, um, the, the resource allocation graph to, 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 to uh, visualize what, what the safe states are, right? So the, 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 the argument the resource allocation graph we saw uh, before to know, so if, if I know what are the resources that I could potentially ask, you know, a, a process could ask, you draw these virtual lines to show what I could be requesting to see if potentially I would get into a deadlock, right? So here's a here's an example, right? So process P1 and P2, right? So again, there, there are two resources, R1 and R2, right? And the the, 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 the dark black lines mean that that has been allocated. So P2 is requesting R1, R1 is allocated to P1, right? But when P1 started, it said it would it might use R1 and R2. And when P2 started, it said R1, it will request R1 and R2 too. So the dotted lines mean that I haven't requested this, this stuff yet, but I could potentially ask because when I started P1, could request both these resources. P2 can request both these resources. So this is the this is the state that I could be if you actually, actually followed through, right? So right now, the only the the dark lines have been um, have happened, right? But P1 and P2 can potentially request these things, and potentially that could get into a deadlock, and use that to make analysis of whether what state you are and what state you will you could end up in, right? So. If, so if you're requesting, so in this case, right, if P2 requests R2, right, since R2 is not being used by anybody, it could be allocated. So if you did that, right, you essentially have something like this. That means you are getting into unsafe state because even though P1 hasn't requested R2, P1 could request R2, and if it did, you're getting into a deadlock, right? So this is unsafe state because at this point, even though there's no deadlock, you're one request away from deadlock because we know that P1 is requesting R2, right? It hasn't requ requested yet, but we know it's going to request at some point. But if it did, you'll get into deadlock. Yeah. In general, in terms of the graph, is this like the definition of an unsafe state when you're one edge away from entering? You're not, not necessarily one edge away, but it, it can get complicated depending on how many processes you have, right? But you have to do the analysis. So. Before you couldn't do this analysis because you didn't know that this dotted line exists, right? But now that you have the dotted line, you treat the dotted lines as straight lines, and then you do the analysis on this one. And if you look at this, obviously there's a circular cy cyclic weight. So obviously there's a possibility of a deadlock. So if you want to avoid deadlocks, you can't let this happen, right? Because if you let this happen, then the next state would um, would get into a deadlock, right? Or, or if you did if you did allow this to happen, you can't allow the next next you can't. P1 cannot request uh, R2 anymore, right? So we'll, we'll continue with this on the next lecture. <coughs>